Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar entitled Quarterly Market Investment Update and Important Financial Considerations. Uh, this one-hour session is being hosted by CBM and the firm's investment advisory subsidiary, MBI, and our presenters today are Debbie May and Alex Lesnar. Uh, Debbie is a partner at CBM, a co-lead for the firm's financial planning and divorce litigation divisions, and she is co-founder and chief investment officer of MBI. She has 35 years of experience providing comprehensive financial planning and nearly 30 years of providing investment advisory services. Uh, Debbie is a certified public accountant, a certified financial planning professional, and a certified divorce financial analyst. She has been recognized nine times by Washingtonian Magazine for her financial advisory expertise throughout the Washington, D.C. metropolitan region, including most recently as a top money expert in January 2021. Uh, Alex is a partner, a senior advisor, and a portfolio strategist at CBM, and he's co-founder and chief operating officer of MBI. He's a certified financial planner and a chartered financial analyst who leads the firm's investment management division. Alex's professional focus is on comprehensive financial planning and investment management. In addition to today's market update, which he leads with Debbie on a quarterly basis, so you'll no doubt be hearing from us again in about three months ago for, for another session. Uh, Alex is also a regular speaker for the firm, and he is scheduled to present on September 16th in a session entitled Grow Your Net Worth, Top Strategies and Opportunities for Mid-Career Professionals, and on October 21st in a session focused on long-term care planning. We're still developing that session, so we don't have a title yet. Uh, thank you for those of you who uh, submitted questions during the registration process. Uh, those have been submitted to our speakers beforehand, so they'll be able to answer your questions throughout today's session. Uh, if you do have questions during the session, please feel free to leave them in the chat box, and they will also respond to them throughout the next hour. Uh, this session is being recorded, and all attendees will receive a copy of the presentation slide. So if you are participating on your phone, uh, I'm not sure who you are, so please do email me or Marissa, my colleague, your name, so we can make sure you get a copy of the slides. And with that, I'm going to turn it over now to Debbie and Alex. Great. Thank you, Joe. And thank you, everybody, for attending today. I hope you're enjoying the summer, and if you're a fan, also enjoying the Olympics. Um, so we're going to basically about MBI. Uh, we are an investment advisory firm. We manage investments on a discretionary basis, fee only. We're currently managing about 300 million in assets. Um, we do provide comprehensive financial planning uh, with those services as well. And also we provide hourly financial planning services through CBM and, and registered investment advisory advice on an hourly basis. So you're going to hear from Alex first. He's going to talk about the market update. That's our primary focus. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, the question that we get very often, especially now on renting versus buying a home. Alex. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. And again, thanks everyone for joining us today uh, on this actually somewhat cloudy uh, day, at least here in Maryland. So as always, we'll update everyone on what's been happening uh, with the markets over the past quarter, so since this is our quarterly market update, um, we'll certainly share some of our top ideas um, as we discuss the markets. And then, of course, in terms of one of the hottest uh, discussion points over the past quarter or so, well, of course, it's it's about uh, inflation. And what's, what's interesting about that, it's not about inflation itself. I would say many, perhaps even most people, expected that it would be higher given, you know, how well um, the economy has been recovering, you know, here in the U.S., but it's more about, you know, how much more of it and for how much longer um, should we expect it to persist. Um, so we'll certainly discuss that in more detail um, in our webinar today. So as always, we'll start with the market conditions in terms of where we are at this point. Uh, in terms of the year-to-date performance, this is as of last Friday, really hasn't changed drastically over the past um, one and a half days or so. Uh, domestic large cap stocks are leading the way. Um, they're up more than 17% for the year as a group. Um, and what's interesting here is that most of those gains actually came from the second quarter of the year, including, of course, um, uh, July. We're already getting closer to the to the end of July, actually. Um, domestic small cap stocks are up 
up close to 13% for the year, uh, but in some sense it's the opposite. Most of the gains came from the first quarter of the year, so in some sense there they've been flat um, over the past three to four months. Um, developed international markets uh, are actually accelerating. They're up 8.6% for the year. Um, most of the gains came from the second quarter of the year. Uh, emerging markets are essentially flat um, for the quarter. They're up 3.6, uh, 3.7% 3. Well, 3 for the year. Most of the gains really came from the first quarter of the year. And in terms of emerging markets, just as a reminder, uh, especially Asian economies, they were uh, some of the best performers in 2020. In terms of domestic bonds, well, uh, as measured by the Barclays Aggregate Bond Index, uh, they're actually in the negative for, for the year, negative 1.6%. Um, bonds, again, as a category, um, recovered quite a bit in the second quarter of the year. A lot of that is really attributable um, to the 10-year 10, 10 treasury yields that came down um, over the past, again, three to four months or so. As a reminder, um, the 10-year Treasury um, yields, which are considered to be the essentially the market's um, rate, um, they almost doubled um, in the first quarter of the year. So that's one of the major reasons, again, why the bonds were down so much. Um, since then, um, they declined to 1.2, 1.3%. In terms of the sector performance, um, energy and real estate sectors are the best performers for the year, um, and what you're not seeing there, but perhaps it should be included, um, financials, you know, financials, banks, and actually investment management companies, uh, they're the third best performer. Um, consumer staples and utilities, say so more defensive sectors, are in the bottom. But of course, notice pretty much all sectors are in the positive for the year. Now, a couple of things to observe here. This is a broad-based rally that we've been experiencing this year, but at the same time, more cyclical, perhaps more value-oriented sectors such as energy, such as real estate, and again, financials that are not on the slide are really leading the way. So that tells you something about the sentiment of the markets. In terms of our market uh, outlook, I'd say for the rest of the year, really, we do expect to see more volatility, perhaps you know, this summer, perhaps closer um, to the fall. Uh, there are multiple reasons why I believe um, why we believe that may be the case. One of them is purely statistical. We actually haven't had a single correction uh, since March of 2020, since the drastic, I would say, market decline that we experienced last year. Um, and statistically speaking, again, we expect at least two market um, corrections each year. For those of you who are less familiar, that's when the market is down by 10% or more. In terms of the sentiment, well, it's becoming more and more bullish. Again, some of the sectors that are leading the way are more cyclical. Again, they tend to be more volatile. So if slash when the sentiment changes, usually that results in more market volatility, at least in the short run. It doesn't necessarily mean that the rally would stop. It doesn't mean that at all. But at the same time, again, that, that increases the risk of more volatility. In terms of the economic growth, understanding, of course, that there is not necessarily a perfect correlation um, between you know, corporate revenues and corporate earnings in the stock market and economy, but there is some correlation, and it's expected to peak in the second or perhaps third quarter uh, quarters of the year. We'll talk about that separately. And perhaps, again, in terms of the expectations, um, they will also be lower going forward. Now, one of the things that's been on the news more and more, and I'm, I'm inclined to say perhaps the markets haven't, they're not necessarily appreciating it, appreciating it all that much, is the Delta variant. Um, again, this is not something that we wanted to discuss in any particular detail today. Just a couple of things here. In terms of the uh, vaccinations or full vaccination rates in the U.S., well, they're slightly above 50 percent um, as of now, which is actually not that great. Um, there's a pretty significant di discrepancy depending on where you are, if you're up north or down south. But in some sense, regardless of that, and here's a Here's an interview um, of um, Bob Walker, who is the chairman of the University of California. I thought it was curious. So here's what he said. He said, take San Francisco, where more than three quarters of those over the age of 12 are fully vaccinated um, and daily cases are up fourfold while hospitalizations have doubled. 
he gave this interview last week, so this is very recent. San Francisco's numbers are still fairly low and are cause for caution, not panic, but this kind of uptick in the most vaccinated American city shows that the Delta variant is very real and that places with much lower vaccination rates may get clobbered. Again, from our perspective, we don't necessarily believe that the lockdowns will be back. But again, in terms of the short term, in terms of you know, market volatility, that may very well be the trigger point. In terms of the earnings expectations, you know, quarter over quarter, um, the consensus estimate for the second quarter of the year is up 74% uh, versus the second quarter of 2020. Well, in some sense, we're obviously starting with a very low base. Um, in the second quarter of 2020, that's when we're really in the very middle of the pandemic. Uh, now, if that happens, and there's a good reason, there are many good reasons to believe that that will happen, this will actually be the highest since the fourth quarter of 2009. That's when the earnings increased by more than 100%. In terms of the, again, second quarter earnings season, um, uh, 24%, actually more than that at this point, um, of the S&P 500 companies already reported their earnings. Uh, the majority of, of the companies reported positive earnings per share EPS surprise, so meaning they outperformed the expectations. Uh, now, the question is always how much of that has already been priced in. And I would say a good example of that, again, is the financials. So the financial companies, again, banks, large investment management companies, they're usually the first ones to report. On average, they outperformed by 26 percentage point, 26 percentage point uh, points. The day they reported, they were down between two to 4%. Well, why? Again, without going into much detail company by company, well, because their expectations are not as great as they used to be prior to this quarter. So again, a lot of that has perhaps already been priced in. In terms of the annual returns, for the markets, as uh, some or perhaps many of you know, that is something I rarely discuss. I try to stay away from any short term, from discussing any short term expectations. But in terms of what we've been reading, really comes from some of the you know, major analysts and institutions. Uh, the range is still between eight to to seventeen and a half percent. I haven't seen anyone expecting that the markets will be up uh, by more than 20, even though, again, the S&P is already essentially at 17% for the year. In terms of the economic conditions, uh, well, would you believe that the economic recovery will continue um, throughout the year, essentially in the second part of the year, uh, perhaps at a slower pace? As I mentioned earlier, there's more and more talk about the so-called peak growth in the second quarter of the year. and in conjunction with everything else we're seeing, perhaps we're, we're getting closer and closer to the so-called mid-cycle phase of a typical business cycle. And we'll talk about that separately in just a moment. Uh, that happens to be the longest phase uh, and with moderate growth. And again, we'll, we'll talk about that separately. Well, in terms of what the federal government has been doing, including, of course, the Federal Reserve Bank on both fiscal and monetary side, um, well, we expect them um, to continue essentially what they've been doing. That said, though, um, the, the Fed is meeting this week, actually. Their next meeting, I believe, is on Thursday. And perhaps we'll see a reduction in their monthly bond purchases. You know, as for some of you who are perhaps less familiar, they've been buying um, 120 billion bonds each month to essentially stimulate the economy. So perhaps they'll slow down on the bond purchases. In terms of the US GDP growth, no particular updates actually. Uh, the figures remain mostly the same, 7% um, or higher for the year, for the entire 2021. Um, in terms of the peak growth, again, is expected to be as high as 10% in the second quarter of the year. We'll actually find out pretty soon. And then there's gonna be a decline going forward. Um, the Fed's estimate, which tends to be more conservative, is still at 6.5%. Inflation, something that we'll have you know, several slides dedicated to, is at 5.4%, and this is for 12 months ending in June of this year. That is, of course, significantly higher 
compared to where we were earlier this year. And again, the question is not so much where we are, but where are we going? And that really depends on your perspective. And the Fed's target is 2%, by the way. Uh, and they would allow for moderate increases above the target if slash when um, you know, they actually reach that point. Also, no particular updates on the unemployment rates themselves. Um, it's currently at 5.9% in the US. It was at 6% in March of this year. And in terms of the unofficial, or how some people refer to it, you know, real um, unemployment rate is closer to 10%. And again, it in includes people who are discouraged um, and or waiting to actually begin seeking for employment. Perhaps they're taking care of their children. Um, so there's a variety of different groups. As a reminder, by the way, the unofficial figure was as high as 26% um, in the middle of the pandemic, so in the middle of last year. So in terms of the business cycle update, I believe this is the first time actually we're discussing this in our quarterly webinars, um, something we tend to review at least quarterly. So without necessarily going into much detail, a typical business cycle in the United States um, lasts between one to 10 years, one to 10 years, but the average is really seven. And any business cycle can be separated in four, I would say relatively distinct sections. You have the early recovery um, uh, phase when the economy is booming, um, more volatile, more cyclical, more economically sensitive stocks tend to do well. Then you have the mid-cycle uh, phase uh, of the business cycle. That's usually when you see you know, some growth, but it begins to decline. The, the rate isn't that high anymore um, in terms of the economy, in terms of the revenues, in terms of the earnings. It's still easy to get credit. Interest rates are still low, but they can't really go down any further, right? which is perhaps what we're seeing right now. Um, in terms of the inventories, they tend to go up uh, because there is a lot of demand. And again, where the US and Canada is at this point, um, again, if you look at what's happening, um, I happen to agree with that assessment. And of course, in the late business cycle, that's when things really begin to slow down. It's harder to get credit. Um, and then the recession begins. Um, one thing I will say, it's relatively easy to say where we are, where we were, I should say, in retrospect. It's not always so easy to say when you're looking at it in real time because you can you can actually uh, look at um, conflicting data. In terms of the asset class returns, uh, this is actually one of one of my favorite charts to discuss. And essentially, what it shows you, it shows you the performance of each major asset class on an annual basis uh, from 2011 to year to date or to 2021. And then we essentially give you the average um, for the past um, essentially 10 and a half years. So real estate, or to be very specific, I do want to be specific here, this is the public real estate or so-called real estate investment trusts, um, is the best performing sector for the year, up 32% for the year. Commodities as a basket, these are 10 major commodities, are up 21% for the year. Large and mid-cap stocks happen to be pretty much at the same point, 17% or so. Small caps are doing well for the year, 14.5%. Well, of course, the balanced portfolio that consists of 60% stocks and 40% bonds will almost always be in the middle. Um, developed international economies you know, uh, have been outperforming emerging markets. Um, cashes, cash and cash alternatives are essentially flat for the year. And then domestic bonds um, are the only asset class that is in the negative for the year. So in our webinar today, I don't necessarily want to focus on different asset classes, but I'll just say this in terms of commodities. Notice that there is a reason why we highlighted this in yellow they tend to be extremely cyclical. And even though, yes, as a basket, they performed quite well year, year to date, notice that for most other years, you know, if you look over the past 10 years, they're pretty much um, at the bottom. So with commodity investing, you really have to be careful. Yes, they tend to perform well when the inflation ex is accelerating, but again, if slash when it begins to slow down, you would usually experience a pretty sudden drop. 
in terms of the performance of the domestic stocks, uh, and this is, by the way, something that we do pay close, very close attention to when we you know, implement our investment strategies or when we rebalance our portfolios. Because you see, when someone tells me my portfolio is up 10% or the market is up 15%, well, that is meaningful, of course, but once you start looking under the hood, you know, you, you never know exactly what you're going to see there. So for the first quarter of the year, it was, of course, a good quarter. It was all about value stocks. Again, usually these are more mature companies, usually those that don't necessarily have, uh, you know, great long term growth prospects. But at the same time, they also tend to be more economically sensitive, small value and mid-value stocks really dominated the markets. And the value as a category was up more than 12% for the year. Notice large cap stocks, especially large growth stocks and growth category um, as a whole was essentially flat or in a slight negative for the year. Things actually changed drastically in the second quarter of the year. Value stocks are still in the positive. They even appreciate in value even more. But large growth stocks are up by actually more than 15% just in the second quarter of the year. The entire growth category is up close to 15. So for those of you who participated in our previous, what I would say, two webinars, we talked about this whole rotation from growth to value. So now we're essentially observing the opposite. People are buying more into growth. They're not necessarily selling value yet, but in terms of their new purchases, as you can see on this slide, they're certainly more into growth-oriented stocks. So the, I just want to say, I want to go back to that slide for a quick second. I just sorry. find it fascinating. This really goes to the value of diversification, not just stocks and bonds, but all the various sectors, the styles. And you can see, I mean, how dramatically the changes in just a short short period of time so anyway. absolutely i mean to to add to that again if you look at the first quarter of the year and i know it's already in the past it's all about small value stocks um, so-called forgotten stocks that was their nickname after 2020 i mean no one really wanted to touch them but nevertheless that's where we are at this point uh, so again Inflation. Uh, this is one of the top questions this day. Is this uh, uh, this days? Is this a major concern, or is this a temporary or transitory issue? And the word transitory, I used it so many times over the past um, several months. So behind the transitory idea, well, Mr. Mr. Powell, the, the chairman of the Fed, he is really the one um, who truly believes in that. And the idea is that most of the growth or a big chunk of it and most of the inflation that is related to that can really be des uh, described by the pent up demand for certain goods and services that were under consumed essentially in 2020 throughout the um, you know, global pandemic. Um, it is cyclical in nature. It relates to the post COVID reopening if slash when, you know, people essentially satisfy their demand for those goods and services, well, the, the economic growth will begin to slow down. And as a result of that, um, the overall levels of inflation will be, will go back to, to the normal, which is, you know, somewhere between two to two and a half percent. Now, I will say there's a lot of backup for this opinion. I summarized it for you essentially in three bullet points, but there's a lot of research done saying that perhaps, yes, that's exactly what we're going to see again in the mature economy um, um, like, like in the US. Now, there's a different group um, who essentially agrees with all of those arguments, but believes this is just the beginning of what we should expect to see um, going forward, meaning you know the levels of inflation that we're experiencing now will become more persistent. So if you look, at the wage growth, especially over the past couple of quarters. And, as, and once you look at the, um, what's happening with the labor force, and I'm, I'm just referring to what's happened in the US, of course. Uh, at this point, there are more than 9 million jobs that are not being filled. So, well, some of the arguments, perhaps people are afraid to go back to work. They're afraid of the Delta variant, perhaps, you know, they're still collecting their unemployment benefits and they don't have you know, significant incentives to do so. But then you look at uh, a job such as uh, skilled 
blue collar jobs. And that's 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 one of the major points. There are lots of issues to begin with, even pre COVID. Now, once we start talking about things such as onshoring, such as you know producing more things in the U.S. Uh, becomes much bigger of a problem. Uh, one example I have, and I understand, of course, it's anecdotal. Um, in New York State, there was this billboard posted on one of the major um, highways. They were looking for a plumber, and they were willing to pay that person $120,000 a year plus a sign-up bonus. So that tells you something. With housing costs and rents, so as of course many, or perhaps most of you know, uh, housing prices have been going up at a very rapid pace. Um, now that is actually not reflected in CPI, without necessarily getting technical here. What is reflected is this hypothetical rent that a typical person would pay. So if slash when again rents to begin begin to go up, perhaps we'll see more inflation. And then, of course, you know, the, the elephant in the room, so to speak, if you look at the existing fiscal and monetary policies, well, perhaps, again, this is just the beginning of what we should be expecting to see um, over the next, you know, two or three plus years. So under this scenario, you're looking at four to five percent annualized and perhaps even higher. In terms of our perspective, well, we are somewhere in the middle and this is not to be you know, diplomatic and just kind of pick this middle road. We we happen to agree with the transitory arguments and to a certain degree with agree with the persistent arguments. If you look at it from the perspective of global supply chains, right? The the world is changing, the economies are changing. Um, how exactly how long will it take us to modify them? And um, I like to use Intel's CEO is an example. So he spoke about it, um, what, a couple of months ago at this point, uh, in terms of the shortages when it comes to computer chips, he is expecting them to persist for at least two years. So there is a pretty significant spike in demand, right? Because we're trying to transition to the cloud, you know, this whole idea of working from home. And, you know, it will take some time to actually um, satisfy that demand. In terms of the labor force, well, once you start paying someone a certain salary and once other you know participants join that particular industry well chances are they'll demand um, more or less the same level of pay of course depending on their qualifications and that can be sticky so in terms of our perspective and of course um, that would impact our thinking in terms of the asset allocations three to three and a half percent is what we envision in intermediate term <clears throat> Now, in terms of some of the examples, there's just so many on each side, essentially. Um, lumber prices, we actually had um, one of the uh, participants wanted to ask this question, and there was a, this great case study on uh, supply and demand shocks. So lumber prices uh, were as high as $1,670 uh, per thousand board feet, talking about the futures market. Um, as it, what was it in, in May on May 7th. Now, a little more than two months later, prices dropped to $584 again per thousand board feet. And that is actually below the level that we experienced in September of last year when we're just beginning to recover from the pandemic. Again, this is just a classic example of the supply and demand shocks. Now, there is no shortage of lumber. It's just that, again, when you have so many people wanted it at the same time, well, what's going to happen? Well, of course, the prices will likely go up. And that, that again, back to that whole idea of commodities um, tends to be, again, tends to be the case for most of them. Now, in terms of the wages, and this, this I thought was actually a very good chart that demonstrates that. So notice that over the past essentially several decades, uh, there's been a decline in, in the overall wage growth, but there's been this relative parity between, let's just say, white collar and blue collar jobs, you know, management professional related versus other occupations. Well, notice over the past quarter or so, there's that significant gap between the two. So perhaps the, the gap will continue to widen because there's a pretty significant, again, shortage, especially of certain um, skilled um, blue collar lab labor. Now, before we you know, sum this up for you and before we talk about some of the strategies that we're considering, um, 
hedges, right? So what are some of the ways to hedge against inflation? Um, one of the you know, reports that are reviewed essentially compares domestic stocks or U.S. equities to gold. And what's particularly interesting about that, it segregates the performance in five different categories. So let's say when you have no inflation or it's actually a deflationary period, you have very low levels of inflation, something that we experienced prior to 2019. Let's say low inflation, two to four percent, moderate, four to six. And then, of course, let's just say high inflation above six percent. So notice in four out of five periods, domestic stocks significantly outperformed gold. And again, gold is considered to be one of the classic hedges against inflation. Well, what does this mean to us? This by any means doesn't mean that you shouldn't be investing in gold. I mean, that's that's a separate question. But what it means is that depending on your expectations, perhaps again, allocating more to equities is a better choice compared to and buying gold in this particular case, especially given its performance, which is almost flat, so only two percentage points over the past uh, actually few decades. So to sum this up, um, we do believe that we're getting closer and closer to this mid-cycle phase of the business uh, of the business cycle in terms of some of the investment ideas that we've been implementing in our um, investment in our um, managed portfolios, um, essentially reviewing and adjusting allocations to mid and small cap stocks, especially on the value category. Again, they tend to be more cyclical. They tend to be more volatile when things are changes, uh, changing. So this would be a good time to review and potentially adjust. Um, now, what would, you be, what would you be buying? How would you use the, prece uh, the proceeds? Well, consider so-called quality stocks. Now, there is no universal definition of what a quality stock is. You know, if Debbie and I have that conversation, perhaps we'll agree on most, perhaps we'll disagree on some. But essentially, these are companies that have strong earnings, right? They have strong revenues. Uh, they usually in, have is in established industries. And one way to describe them, they have the ability to control their destiny. They don't necessarily depend that much on the latest product or, what, on, or, or on the market sentiment. They don't even depend that much on the economy itself. Of course, it would impact um, um, their revenues and earnings. Now, without going into much detail, of course, part of this webinar, you would normally find those in large bland, large growth, mid bland, and mid growth categories. Doesn't mean that they don't exist in other categories, but that's where you would um, find those types of investments. In terms of international investing, and from our perspective, uh, we usually compare developed and emerging, you know, overweight or underweight, uh, depending on the market conditions. Would you prefer European at this point versus um, emerging markets in general? Uh, one of the reasons behind that is, again, as we discussed earlier, they seem to be in the earlier stages of the business cycle. And one thing that I don't think it was discussed all that much really, um, in December, that's right, in December of last year, they actually passed the so-called long-term budget and next generation EU, um, European Union stimulus package, which is more than $2 trillion that will be spent on a variety of projects over the next six years. So they're really trying to stimulate their economy and perhaps the effects of that will be seen again soon. In terms of the valuations, um, year to date, uh, domestic stocks significantly outperformed European equities. So the valuation valuations widened over the past six months or so. Not sure if that's necessarily a strong argument because over the past say few decades, that's been the case. But from the valuation perspective, you can look at it. Also from the dividend income perspective, European stocks specifically tend to pay more than domestic stocks, and this is this is just on average. In terms of the inflation protection ideas, well, as simple perhaps as it may sound to some people, well, if that is a concern of yours, and especially if you believe that it will remain at, at this elevated level, but it will not skyrocket, um, which is what we experienced in the 70s and early 80s, well, consider higher allocations to stocks. Again, what kind of stocks depends on your risk tolerance, depends on your time horizon, your portfolio cash needs, 
but that's a good way again to hedge against inflation. Commodities, again, they tend to perform well when the expectation, when the inflation expectations are going up, but they tend to be extremely volatile and cyclical. So be comfortable, be, be careful with those. Now, when I talk about commodities, I'm referring to commodities themselves, such as oil, such as um, you know lumber, um, and I'm also referring to the companies that produce those commodities. You know, they're um, just as cyclical. Now, real estate. Um, and Debbie will talk about that separately, but specifically the um, real estate investment trusts or REITs, essentially, essentially public, publicly available options. Well, if or perhaps when um, inflation continues to go up, um, real estate prices tend to go up at the same time. And also as a result of that, the rents are uh, would place eventually begin to go up. With REITs, they tend to pay quite nicely. Usually in the typical REIT would pay somewhere three to 5%. So if you're looking for more income, that would be a good option for you. Plus again, um, if, if we see higher levels of, ex, um, of inflation, perhaps there's gonna be some protection in place for you. And then finally, uh, this is a great time to rebalance your portfolio. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we completed our semi-annual rebalancing for our managed accounts. Um, if you're doing it on your own, this is this is a great time. Why again? Because things things changed drastically, I would say, over the past six and especially 12 months. So if you haven't looked at it for 12 for maybe six months, this would be a great time to do so. And with that, I'll ask Debbie to talk about some of our financial planning ideas. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Alex. That was very informative. And I want to just say another thing about rebalancing. We do believe that that's really where you're going to get 90% of your return is just by being very disciplined about rebalancing. And I know a lot of our portfolios have been balanced, rebalanced multiple times that's in right. the past year and a half because of the volatility for sure. So I'm going to talk a little bit about renting or buying a personal residence, getting a lot of questions about that and, and have over the years where people are trying to analyze it, financially speaking, in terms of what, what makes sense, what can they afford, et cetera. And it's, I'm not here to be a, a, you know, a real estate professional or come at it from that perspective, but how do we approach this thought process? So in starting out here, you can see at this, the bottom of this slide, a house, and this is the DC metro area we're looking at, was about 325,000 in 2011 in terms of the, the median price. In December 2020, it was 490,000. And when you look at that year over year, you know, for that time period, it's about a, under a 5% return, if you will, 4.8, I think it was when Alex and I looked at it, right. uh, in terms of what you would have gained in that real estate uh, that you owned. And you can see that the average price DC metro area is 490,000, um, which is in highlighted in yellow, about a 6.5% increase over 2019. And I will tell you, I just looked at this the other day, for single family homes, the median price in the DC area is now 737,000. That has set a record. Um, people are buying houses in about 30 days is the average turnaround to settlement. And 60% of those sales are over asking price. And then if you're looking at including condos, other types of real estate, the average price is 570,000 now. So you can see how much that is over December, 2020. So it's quite a market. Um, and I will tell you right now, about 37% of people across all generations in the United States are now renting. And that has is the highest level since the mid 1960s. So there has to be some reasons for that. And, you know, I think as we all know, buying or renting is going to be one of the biggest decisions that you will make uh, in your lifetime. So it is it is worth really, you know, carefully analyzing. And right now we know the real estate market has been a bit crazy. Uh, people are panic buying, kind of like what we experienced with toilet paper back in March of 2020. So I think that's pretty well known that we're in just sort of a crazy market right now. And, you know, when you're talking to people about buying a home, I mean, we really have been, this is part of what I'm going to say is an ideal situation where people are looking at this as the American dream, that that's their ultimate goal uh, is to is to have home ownership. So let's let's explore this a little bit further. Next slide. 
So here's a picture to share with you. This is my son who was recently married just a few weeks ago in Southern California, and that's his beautiful bride. It was, it was, gives me chills. That was quite something. And guess what we're talking about now? How are they going to get a home? They're in Southern California. It's, it's craziness there too. You have to be walking around with, with cash ready to escalate, no contingencies, no inspections. And so they're going to wait a bit. So we're, this is a weekly conversation that we have in terms of the pros and cons. So next slide. So I came up with what I'm going to consider to be the five top reasons to rent and what are the considerations. And I will tell you the number one, and this is really from a lot of different professionals, I would say, is your time frame. So it's basically the market is cyclical in real estate like a lot of other things. And the market right now we know is really high relative to what we don't know. But we do remember 2008, where we had a major, major drop in the real estate market. Some people were even underwater and we might've all agreed that that was really a low place in the market. But on average, we're looking at five to seven years. Some people will go 10, but five to seven years on average would be the time period that you'd want to be committed to to probably break even. We're not looking at trying to make money. But we're looking at the closing cost. You know, there's probably 10% would be paid to get in and get out combined. So you need a 10% increase in value just to break even. And that doesn't include a lot of other costs that we could talk about. But that's that's what we look at is a time frame. If you're shorter than that, probably makes sense to rent. Um, the other one is what I'm going to call transitions. Now, transitions come in basically three flavors. You know, one is the personal type of transitions. Um, your child is just left for college. You're recently divorced. You're, you're widowed. Um, you have, you know, other things going on in, in your life that make, you know, job changes, et cetera, that make it a little bit unclear as to where you want to be going. And the second transition would be what I'm going to call location. Like you're really looking at a whole nother state. You're looking from East Coast to West Coast or Northeast to Southeast, and you're thinking, you know, I don't know about that location situation. And again, test driving might make sense to see how you land on that one. And then the other one is configuration. And what I mean by that is going from the big single family home, and now I'm going to go live in a condo that's 1,500 square feet, or I'm going to downsize from a large house to a very small house, a, a townhouse. Etc. And that to me is a big transition as well that might be worth, you know, test driving. And we're not saying that you wouldn't make money necessarily. You could obviously pick a wonderful location and hit the market just right. But this is really to look at what would the normal scenario be to evaluate the next one. And we get asked to do this quite a bit. Um, we've done it recently for someone uh, is the investment strategy. And this is where we look at literally a cost analysis and and we come up with projections of assumptions. So we really like to have two scenarios, like give me your best scenario in terms of where you would be if you were renting. Tell me about what it looked like if you were buying. Let's put some real numbers on this and talk about the down payment, what would be invested, what's the monthly payment, what's the overall cost that we would see in this property, taxes, insurance, condo fees, obviously maintenance. And you know, here we're trying to again, come up with a time frame and we're normally looking at this five to ten year period we're not trying to project what are you going to look like 25 years from now but give us some reasonable time frames that you might look like at the end and people will make decisions based on that especially if it's significantly different um the you know the other thing is we really are looking at the package deal of what it looks like to own a house and so for example there can be other costs that you really aren't thinking about for example are you going to have a lot of land to take care of are you going to be driving a lot more so you might have to replace your car more often um, pay more for gas because you're now in this location that's not really where you're going to be spending most of your time um, the other thing that we talk about on the renting side when we're talking about saving that money um, of any sorts that we've added up and saving the down payment is, are you really going to save it? So there's always that argument that maybe you would have just enjoyed a more of a lifestyle, or maybe you would have not saved that money. And so the analysis becomes a little bit skewed that way. Uh, the other issue is unexpected maintenance. And what I mean by that is that even if you've had a house inspection, 
you know, if, especially if it's an older house, they're going to tell you the age of the HVAC, the roof, the water heater, the appliances, big ticket items. And you know they're going to have to be replaced at some point, but you don't know exactly when and you don't know exactly what the cost would be, especially if you needed a lot of lumber back in May. <laughs> but That's right. you know, the idea here is that these are things that are going to come up and bite you a little bit that you have to really either be thinking about those costs and budgeting them out, or you could even be at risk that you're having to borrow the money to make those um, repairs, not necessarily even improvements that might improve the value. So now you've got an interest cost, you have more debt that wasn't necessarily anticipated when you're buying the house. And then the last one I have is really the value of your most valuable asset. And what that is, is your time. So some people really don't like to do maintenance. You see this couple here and they're sort of, it looks like they might even be arguing a little bit that they are not enjoying having to do these fix up types of maintenance things. They'd rather be spending their time perhaps traveling. Um, you're also, if you're not gonna be in the house a lot because you are traveling, et cetera, then you've got the issues of who's watching the house who's what's kind of security is going on. It's not a turnkey necessarily operation. Some people love home maintenance. So that's another situation. So that's that's the renting side. Now, the next slide is about buying. Like what might be your top five reasons to buy? One is, and I think most people understand, is you're building equity and then ultimately wealth. And what that means by building equity is that you're making a payment that includes a principal payment. So you're paying down the mortgage over time and eventually maybe not even have a mortgage. So you've built equity just by that payment of the mortgage. And ultimately wealth really has to do with the time period. So we're looking at, if you start projecting out 10, you know, over seven years, 10 years plus, and looking at maybe inflation, the real estate price averages in the location that you're looking at, you could see that that asset is also gonna go up in value and you've only had to make a down payment. So you're getting a percentage of increase on an entire asset where you necessarily didn't have to put all that cash down. The next one is forced savings, somewhat related, but here it's where you have to make this payment. You know, you're forcing yourself to save by paying down that principal and so it's not even anymore at your discretion necessarily. I think the risk here that I see in assuming that is the tendency to want to borrow out of the house. So some people are using home equity lines of credit. And a lot of times we recommend them because you need to have a safety net or a backup plan. And that may be what you end up using, not necessarily to improve the value of the asset that you own, but you might be spending it on college expenses that you might have needed to save for and, and didn't do that or these unexpected repairs I'm describing or other discretionary things that are not gonna come back to you in terms of increasing the value. That also can happen with refinancing because refinancing costs money to do. There's some closing costs involved and you might be looking at taking some cash out. The next one is also investment strategy. And this is where we're looking at mainly diversification. So you're thinking, well, real estate, that's another part of my portfolio and that's gonna maybe operate differently than, than stocks or bonds, et cetera. So it gives me some diversification. And you might have also thought about, you know, I've picked this great location. I've got really good timing in the market, feel really good about this. We are relatively insulated in the DC area. You might be looking at schools, et cetera, and think this is always gonna be a very valuable asset to own. But also keep in mind that it is illiquid. So if you're looking at situations where I'm going to just sell it tomorrow, unless you're in this particular market as we sit today, it's going to take a lot longer to try to get the house ready to be sold, to place it up for sale and, and you know, get that cash. It's not like cash in the bank. That's pretty obvious that that would be super liquid. And you're also really at risk in terms of what if you had to sell in a down market? Something happened to you. There's a job loss, a big income loss, uh, a health issue, something that's really commanding you to sell and the market can't really take account for that. It's a low market and you're just forced to sell. So that's that's all I think I'll say about that. I mean, another thing is really a protection against inflation, which I have there is that you have a locked mortgage rate and that can be really big for people. We've got really low interest rates right now. You've got a 30 year fixed mortgage. Maybe that's even 25% of your entire spending is your mortgage payment. And then 25% of your budget is not subject to inflation. 
So now you've got a fixed right. payment. So there's some protection there. Uh, and as we know, real estate will move up with, with inflation over time as it performs. And then there's tax advantages. And the tax advantages are you know, built into your individual income tax return where you can write off some real estate taxes, write off your mortgage interest. When you ultimately sell the house, there is a personal exclusion on part of the gain, pretty large exclusion, 250,000 if you're single, 500,000 if you're married. However, a lot of those tax advantages, I like to remind people, are now gone. And the reason they're gone is, for example, if you're over 65, I believe it is, right, you... Right. You have like a and you're married. You have a twenty six thousand dollars standard deduction. So, and you can only write off up to ten thousand dollars of taxes, state income or real estate. So, for in this area, real estate taxes ultimately become not deductible currently, and the mortgage interest would have to then be over sixteen thousand or so to even get over the standard deduction. So, what I'm telling people to do is not think about this as a tax deduction. Uh, charity can be handled in a number of other ways. So you're really not getting an additional additional tax benefit. Um, so that's what I would say about that. Now, there's some other considerations on the next slide. And these are the sort of the soft factors um, that we don't want to ignore. I mean, it's psychological. There's a lot of people that want to feel settled. Homeownership feels good. Renting fe might feel displaced in a certain way. But that's the, sort of the, all the psychological and emotional components. And then I also ask people, especially in retirement, how many homes are you going to own? You know, some people want to have that second home at the beach. They might want to have a winter home. Um, they might want to have a home, you know, summer home somewhere else. And you could be owning two and three homes. And I think that just makes the decision making even harder because how much time are you going to really spend in those locations? How much time are you going to spend with the upkeep? And what is your sort of risk analysis and sort of hedging that bet? So we go through that analysis as well. And then I mentioned already change of circumstances, the ability to modify your decision that you've already made. And some things come up even like you have grandkids. So now your kids maybe are living in a different location. I get this question a lot and you want to move closer to your kids and grandkids. And so thinking through that analysis as well. And then the fact that it's flexible to have ownership. You can modify your house, you can renovate your house, you can decorate your house, you can basically make it your own. So with that, I will stop. And um, Alex, you want to see if we have some questions? We have about eight minutes to go. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. That was really thorough. <laughs> Definitely something to consider, especially if you're looking to buy in today's hot market. Uh, so yes, please ask your questions. Uh, we will, if, through the chat box, we will read it out loud, but we will not mention your name for privacy reasons. So feel free to do so. Uh, we received actually several questions prior to this webinar. Uh, I do believe we actually addressed two of them throughout the presentation, but here's one. Uh, with inflation and the rise of interest rates, does the price of stocks decrease? as fixed interest rate investments offer a better return with less risk, or does the market price of stocks increase as their value increases from inflation? So it's a, it's a long question, uh, and I would actually, I would prefer to answer it by separating it into two questions here. So the first one, um, in intermediate slash long-term, well, whoever is asking this question is most likely correct. If slash when interest rates begin to go up and it's not expected to happen at least until 2022, and if that happens, we're talking about quarter of a percent, maybe half a percent at most. Well, from the pure relative perspective, um, a bond that pays you, let's say one and a half percent versus 1.75 or maybe 2% is now better than a, let's say a typical stock that on average is expected to earn somewhere between six to 10%. But still, if you look from the absolute perspective, perhaps not so much. So we're not necessarily expecting that to happen in near future. The, the other comment that I have, well, yes, there is a correlation between inflation and interest rates, but it's not perfect. And what we've been experiencing over the past six months is a great example of that. Interest rates, the Fed rate is actually at zero between zero and quarter of a percent. Uh, the 10 year treasury is at 1.2, 1.3, but inflation is at 5.4. So for those who are heavily invested in bonds, well, they're effectively losing money 
they're just not seeing that, but they're losing the pur purchasing power of their bonds. Uh, in terms of, of a long-term investor, should they stay with the current path with stocks or increase diversity, diversification, I guess, into bonds, fixed price investments? Um, David, do you want to address this one or do you want me to cover this? Um, I, I, I make a few comments and then you can jump in. It's all time horizons of when you're going to spend the money. Uh, generally speaking, if you need cash or need distributions from your portfolio over, say, the next five to seven years, we're still in that time frame. We're going to try to keep your fixed income secure, your buffer for those distributions. If it's longer term than that, in terms of when you need the cash, probably going to be equity based for growth. That's I, I entirely agree on that. Uh, and to to address this question again, in terms of uh, a long term investor was specified, um, if you're truly a long term investor, as, as Debbie mentioned, we want you to have that protection in place. Um, but in terms of what we would prefer overweight at this point, it would certainly be stocks versus bonds. Um, we see a lot of risks when it comes to bonds. Again, inflation risk is, is one of them. Um, and from the planning perspective, we like to refer to it as the longevity risk, right? The bonds can, can pay what they're paying now for a while, for the next three, four, five years. And if inflation persists, let's make it three to 4%. Let's not make it too scary. Again, you're effectively losing money. Uh, there's a question from the chat box. I guess we'll address it and perhaps we'll stop at that point. It says, you didn't mention uh, tips for treasury um, inflation protected securities as inflation protection. Is that due to their current valuations? Absolutely. Um, so most uh, tips at this point in the secondary market, if, if you decide to buy them that way, they actually um, have negative yields. So this is not something that we would want to buy today. Of course, if you already have them in your portfolio, well, that's, that's great for you. Let's say you bought them three, four years ago. Um, in terms of bonds in general, and we decided to skip on that on purpose. There are other strategies. Where of course, there are total return bond funds that can help you with that. Um, but again, at this point, if we have a choice between you know, keeping the portfolio where it is or potentially allocating to more stocks, especially those quality stocks that I was referring to, I would prefer to go the stock route. Well, with that, uh, I'll just briefly update everyone on the upcoming events. Uh, our next webinar on August 10th um, will be um, you know, specifically for younger professionals um, on the top strategies and opportunities, you know, grow your net worth, uh, one, of, one of the three that we'll be presenting. Um, on September 2nd, we'll have um, a webinar on the Sound of Secure legislation and how it could impact the retirement. Um, and I will say this, it will impact many other people, not just those who are thinking about retirement. So consider that. Um, for those of you who are in, um, not not-for-profit world, um, we'll have a certified not-for-profit accountant professional training. And as Joe mentioned in the beginning of this webinar, we'll have other quarterly market updates. And in October, actually, we'll have a webinar dedicated to long-term care. We'll have a guest speakers, actually, on that subject. Uh, we have a coronavirus resource center. This is um, uh, designed for businesses, so please visit. Um, we will uh, try to address most of your common questions when it comes to that. Um, and of course, if you have any other questions that you just, you know, perhaps we didn't address them for you today, feel free to reach out to Debbie or myself and we'll be happy to assist you. Yes, great. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the day. Enjoy the rest of the summer. And we'll look forward to speaking to you again, I believe, in sometime in October. That's right. Every three months or so. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone.